Hey, yo, hey, yo, you are not rocking with the best. Breaking records, radio. Records, man. Radio is like the place to be. I don't know. Fuck strange music, man. <laughs> <laughs> Check it out, Breaking Records Radio and the place to be. You know what it is, your host Maloney. And I got a very, very special guest on the phone with me right now, man. We got the legendary Tony Sunshine with us, man. How are you doing? I'm blessed, man. I can't complain. How are you? I can't complain, man. You know, aside from, you know, being stuck inside, you know, and uh, not really knowing how long this might last. You know, got to keep yourself busy, but everything's all blessed aside from that, man. Right, right, right. Yeah, aside from being quarantined and aside from uh, aside from what's going on in the world, I am blessed. I can't complain. You know, God has allowed me a roof over my head and uh, a place to, to to feel safe, and I'm grateful. You know. Yeah, exactly, man. And you know what? You, a lot of people have been complaining. You know, especially when you're online, you see people complaining every day about having to be quarantined and all this stuff, but you know, it's exactly like you said, man, like, we just gotta be happy and blessed that we have roofs over our heads, that we have somewhere we can stay safe, because, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, just even in the States and Canada here alone that don't have that blessing, let alone worldwide, man. Right, right. There are so many, there are so many uh, homeless people out in the street right now without an answer. You know, that need a whole lot of prayer. There are, there are many people that are in prison right now. It's beyond their control. There's nowhere they could go. There's nowhere they could hide. If the, if the virus attacks, it's just going to attack them. There's nothing they could do about it. You know, it's just so many different things that we need to look at and, and, and quit the complaining because uh, things can be worse, you know. Aside from the virus, because the virus is a very, very, very terrible thing, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's, it's a monster in itself. But I mean, besides that, take that away from the equation, and you know, there should really be no, no, no reason to complain unless, unless you are homeless, unless you are in prison, unless you are facing adversities, and you are in in, in a situation where things are on your control. You shouldn't be complaining, you know? Yeah. yeah, it's a fact, man. You know, I'm 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 one of the people who always tries to see the glass half full because that's the thing. No matter what happens in life, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, like even take the virus away from it, it's like, you know, there's always somebody who's got it a lot worse. Not even just somebody. There's always millions of people that got it a lot worse than me, man. You know, it's like as long as you keep that mind state, a lot of times it makes, you know, the things in your day-to-day -day life see very, seem very trivial, you know? is very this, this virus it's not a disease it's a virus is a very cunning virus is a very very deceitful is very you know unexplainable and uh it doesn't care who you are it doesn't care how much money you have it doesn't care how much money you don't it doesn't care how tough you are it doesn't care how young you are it doesn't care how old you are it doesn't give a shit about you you know yeah so it's very important for people to follow rules and regulations and follow protocol. And it seems that that, that, is, that is the hardest part right now for people. Yeah. The hardest part for, for, for some people is to follow protocol, to follow rules and regulations and be told what to do. You know? So it is, it is, it is not going to get better. It's going to get worse before we see some type of of uh, clarity, so to speak, with what's going on. Yeah, for sure, man. And, um, you know, I was going to ask, like, if, if anybody you know personally has been affected by it, but I know you are uh, actually on your new single, Revolution, you got Fred the Godson, and he's actually battling with it right now. So, you know, I want to send my prayers to Fred the yeah, Godson. Yeah, you know, uh, we, have, we have Fred the Godson. God bless him. He's in our prayers. Another very good friend of mine, Jimmy, from Jimmy's Bones Cafe. He's dealing with it. You know, we have another friend uh, by the name of Corleone who, 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 who just came home, and we have a record together, and he's in, uh, a near and dear friend of mine. He's battling the, the, uh, the, the virus. Another near and dear great friend of ours and childhood friend of ours, uh, J.B. Jigahove, you know, he just lost his dad to the virus. 
Like, it's oh, a real man. serious situation, you know, and a lot of people that didn't believe before, you know, are, 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 are believers by force. Yeah. You know, and it's very important. Again, don't wait till it hits home. Don't wait till you're dealing with it yourself to become a believer. It took me about it took me about three or four days to actually become a super believer. You know, because Lofa himself, my brother, yeah. you know, he called me and we had a conversation about it quite a few times. And I was like, yeah, all right, man, this shit gonna, you know, it's gonna come and it's gonna go and it's gonna be like, you know, like, like, like. Like, uh, uh, what was it that hit a few years back? Was it Lyme or, or, or uh, um, Ebola or something like that? Yeah, we've had a few of them. We've had, like, you know, the bird flu, the, what, swine? Swine flu. Yeah. We got quite a few things that came in and came out, but, you know, they, 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 they uh, we found a solution for it, and ultimately it wasn't, it wasn't as significant and as, as, as terrible. Yeah. And the coronavirus. You know. Yeah, man, it's unfortunate, man. Have you had a chance to uh, talk to Fred at all since uh, you know he's been dealing with this? I haven't. I haven't. I haven't had a chance to speak to Fred personally. You know, um, I don't think that they're allowing him to actually get on the phone or use oh. too much energy. Yeah, yeah. You know, I think that his energy is, is to be directed and be utilized towards his recovery. Yeah. So, you know, I've spoken to very, very close friends and family and, you know, um, <clears throat> he's doing better. He's doing much better. But again, I don't think that's for me to speak on. Yeah. That's for his family. That's for his wife and his his. his his wife and his family to give that type of information out. All I can tell you is that we're praying for him deeply and, and, you know, we love him and we're hoping that God allows him to make a full, speedy recovery so that the world can get a glimpse of, you know, more of what he has to offer. Yeah, man, for sure. Fred's Fred's one of those dudes right now who's really holding up the flag for, you know, just fierce, fierce lyricism, like, you know, kind of the the type of flag, you know, almost like, you know, pun held up, you know, he, he's kind right, of in that, right. in that, um, what's the word I'm looking for, in that lineage of just, you know, fierce, fierce spitters, man, you know. He's a super, he, he's a super talented dude, and what's special about him is that he is a true lyricist. Yeah. Like, he is a true lyricist. He's not a rapper, he's not, you know, uh, uh, what do you call it? Uh, there's just so many different ways to put it, but all I can say is that he is the truth of the heart lyricist. He's special, man. Yeah. The way he puts his words together and the metaphors and, you know, the way he comes up with them is just different. It's just a different breed. Yeah, he's very, he's very um, you know, his metaphors are crazy, and he's very, like, you know, he's he's got his own... His own thing too, you know. A lot of I find a lot of lyrical dudes kind of follow in the same lineage of other dudes. You know what I mean? But like he he's found a way to kind of do it very original and kind of has his own. You know, he has his own pocket of doing it, which is one thing I really like about it. Like he, yep. he's innovating with it. Yep. I was that curious. I like agree. how I did how did the uh, revolution joint come about? Like, do you and him got like a long standing relationship, or was he just somebody you seen kind of you know? Well. I know Fred, as you say, I've known Fred for almost 20 years. Oh, wow. You know, I was uh, I was uh, one of the first cats in the industry to actually really uh, pay attention to what he was doing through, through mutual friends, of course. Yeah. You know what I mean? Through, through mutual friends and family that, you know, brought him around and you know, uh, I got to see him in, a, in, in very, 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 very super early stages in development. You know, I, I, I shared a lot of moments with him in the studio. I'm pretty sure that there are a lot of people that have, you know, a few joints in their in, in their in their hard drives with being Fred, just freestyling and, oh, yeah. and shit like that. And you know, like jewelry, we would talk about jewelry over the phone. And, he would get a new bracelet and ring and call me and tell me about it and want to show it to me and vice versa, you know. Like, Fred is really my man. Like, that's really my guy. You know what I mean? So I had Revolution. 
I recorded Revolution about two years ago, you know, and uh, I was in that type of vibe and I was feeling that way. And, you know, uh, I, I heard the beat, I went in and I freestyled it because <clears throat> the majority of my music is just a vibe and of impulse and I don't really like to go in and, re and, and, and rewrite or change too many things, especially when there's a vibe. So that right there, ready to start a revolution, that just, it, it just came from the gut. It's not something that I wrote down. Oh, wow. It's not something that, you know, I had sitting in my head and I thought it would be dope. It's just what I heard when I went in the booth. So I went in the booth, I put the headsets on and the music was playing and that's what came to mind. Ready to start a revolution. I'm hoping that you'll be right. And it just started, you know, it, it, the words just started pouring out on their own. And then I'm what you call a music, a music hoider. I just like record so many songs. I have so many songs just sitting in the, in the archives and just sitting in the studio and the hard drive and things like that. Los was kind of telling me, like, yo, that song is dope. You know, it's dope. And when we in the rooms and I'm playing some of my music for other people, he kind of tells me to play that record. And I'll play that record and people will tell me, bring it back. Like, let me hear that one. What you doing with that one? Yeah. So what was going on and the times and it just made sense. It just matched the times that was going on. I reached out to Fred. I sent him the record and he sent it back like two days later with his verse and he thought that it was an incredible, amazing record, and he was like, yo, bro, video? Like, what we doing? You say the word, we doing it. Ah. You know what I mean? And we spoke about that. We aimed uh, for April 3rd to drop the record. He was happy about it. We was in agreement, and then a few days later, uh, he landed in the hospital. So I waited a few days. We pushed back, but due to the fact that we already had it in the works, and it's something that we had spoke about with the fans. And also, I felt like, yeah, Fred is dealing with something, and he's dealing with the corona, and he's in the hospital. But that doesn't mean that the world doesn't deserve to hear his voice. Yeah. It doesn't mean that his message shouldn't be sent across the world. You know what I mean? Yeah. So we dropped the record anyway. We dropped the record anyway in, in, in hopes and in prayers that it'll uplift him a little bit and send energy waves across the world to God so that God can allow him to get up. Yeah. You know, because cause, cause, cause the power of prayer is impeccable and prayers in, in, in numbers are deniable. Yeah. You know what I'm talking about? So, you know, it's a given. It's a given that the world needs to hear his message and hear his words. So... We put the record out anyway, yeah. and what we did is, it's on SoundCloud, it's for free download, we didn't try to make a dollar off of it, we didn't clout chase and try to, you know, capitalize off of the situation, that's not what we tried to do, it's not what we're trying to do. we just trying to give the people positive energy at this present moment, we're trying to give people a little bit of, uh, of inspiration towards love, love is everything right now. We need love. We need positivity. We need inspiration more than anything at this present moment in time. You know, and it's so easy to make shoot 'em up bang bang records. It's so easy to make turn up, shake your ass, twerk records, throw your money in it. You know, that's easy. What's not easy these days is to come across somebody who's willing to just continuously spread a positive message. And that's what revolution is about. We're not condoning a violent revolution in no shape, form, or fashion. That's not what we call it for. We call it for a love revolution. We call it for a positive revolution. You know what I mean? We call it, we call it for people to open up their eyes and stand firm and realize that we are in a terrible place. We need to stop contributing to the violence. We need to stop contributing to the negative, the, the, the negativity that's going out there. Especially right now with the coronavirus. We're already dying. Yeah. We don't need to contribute to the bullshit because we're already dying. God has already sent us a message. You know what I mean? Yeah. He's already sending us a message that we fucking up. We playing too many games. So I'm a strong believer, man. I'm a strong believer. So if 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 everybody got together and did the right thing, if everybody followed protocol, if everybody stayed home and did what they had to do, you know, things would ease up. Things would ease up, and it, it, it's going to get worse before.
before it gets better. But you know, we gotta we, we gotta keep the faith in our higher power. Yeah. You know, and only he only 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 he can put his healing hand on us. And only he can stop what's going on. But we gotta believe and we gotta start doing what's right. I don't mean to sound like a crazy man, yo. I really don't. I don't mean to ramble off and sound crazy. I'm just speaking my truth and speaking what's in my heart in hopes that I I, I can touch somebody and enlighten them. No, this you know, shit is real. It's true, this though, man. This shit true. is real. It's not fake. It's true, man. And what you say, like, you know, um, I'm a high... Um, I'm not religious, but I'm very high believer in, you know, the power of energy and putting energy out there. And like you said, you know... Uh, at, like energy and numbers and um i agree with you 100 percent. like i think it's important you know um with him battling right now i think it's important that you know his voice still be heard you know and like you said you had right. a release date already set forth so you know i think you know that's what he would like to see done i think he'd still like to see the record come out and stuff and you know people to be able to hear his voice in a positive light opposed to just like l listening and dwelling on the news it's important for you know people to see him in his element and doing the thing he does best and, you know, keep that positive energy moving forward to, you know, to be reciprocated back to him and, you know, help help him, uh, you know, get up out that bed and keep go going harder than ever. Agreed. 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 100%. You hit it on the nose. Yeah, man. Um, but you, you know, um, I'm not, I'm not a religious individual myself. But I am very spiritual, you yeah. know. Being spiritual and being religious are two different things. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. I don't know if if, if 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 you understand what I mean, but that's for another interview anyway. Yeah, yeah. No, I, you know I, I totally mean? get you. I totally get you 100%, man. Um, I'm the exact same way. But yeah, man, for sure. Like, I want to, um, you know, you got so much history in this game, you know, um, I don't even know where to begin. I guess really, like, uh, from the jump, you know, and I... Um, I didn't have as much time as I would have liked to prepare for the interview because, um, you know, me and your manager, were, we kind of had it locked in. Here, bro, I'm quarantined. Yep. I'm quarantined. You quarantined. We ain't got too many places to go. Yep. So we're here. we interviewing. You've got questions. Ask questions. I'm not rushing you off the phone. You yep. know, let's get to it. Dope, man. Yeah. Like I, um, you know, like I said, I, uh, I would have liked to do more preparation but you know i didn't have a hundred percent know that if it was going down today or not so i either way i, d I, d I right. got some good prep work done but you know um i guess like just uh go to well, the one thing one, one thing one thing about los is if he told you he was gonna make it happen he's gonna make it happen he's yep. gonna call me one thousand times he's gonna make sure that i jump on the phone he's gonna make sure that it happens word so up los told you it was gonna go down just know that it was gonna <laughs> go down Word up, man. Um, you know, I just, uh, one thing I really like to do in interviews is try to not ask the same questions a million people ask. So more so in the prep work, that's, that's more so it, you know, cause, um, but, you and, know. And, and that's appreciated. Yeah. That's so appreciated. Cause it becomes so annoying and so generic. It's like, you know, I'm pretty sure you've heard my interviews for the last 10 years. Yeah. You have this information. This information is not only public information. It is generic information. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> you know. So I feel you and I appreciate you. Yeah, definitely, man. And so, you know, I guess to go um, as far back from the beginning as um, basically, you know, we can, um, you, you taught yourself to sing, correct? Say again? You, uh, you're self-taught. Like, uh, with your talents and singing, right? Like, you taught yourself how to sing? Yes. Yep. And I was just yep. I was curious, I have, you know. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. What I, have a, I have an older, I have an older sister who, uh, went to LaGuardia High School Performing Arts. She was an opera major and a drama major as well. Yep. You know, um, she went on to do off-Broadway plays. I would like to say that I would listen to her a little bit music uh, is different from R&B music and hip-hop music and things of that nature, but it is, uh, it takes a, it takes a special kind of technique to sing opera, you know, so I was very intrigued when I was a child just listening to, 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 you know, them sing when we would go to her rehearsals and things like that in her school. <clears throat> But that's about it. Aside from me going to her rehearsals at LaGuardia and watching her 
rehearse and the opera singing and all that when I was a very, very, very small child. You know, I never really had no training in no shape, form, or fashion. And I, I'm pretty much self-taught. When that's, uh, nope. that's crazy too, man, because, you know, I think a lot of the younger kids maybe nowadays don't realize how difficult something like that may be because they have YouTube and stuff, so you could technically teach yourself nowadays by watching tutorials and YouTube videos and stuff, but, you know, coming up, like, and... Yeah, these kids have it all. Yeah, man, but when we were coming up, to, te to self-teach yourself something actually meant you taught yourself, so I was just kind of curious, like, how did you right. go about, you know... Teaching yourself to sing, because with a phenomenal well, would, voice like you, you know, that's, that's... I would mimic, I would mimic my favorite singers. Okay. You know, I would mimic Stevie Wonder. I would mimic Stevie Wonder. I would mimic Lionel Richie. I would mimic Prince. I would mimic Mike. I would mimic Kenny Rogers. Whatever song I was listening to, I would mimic them and master it and sing it just like them. You know, and then I would take bits and pieces of everybody's uh, technique and just make it my own. Yeah. You know, I wouldn't be, I would say I have a distinctive voice. When you hear me, you know that it's me. I really don't, tone-wise, vocal-wise, I really don't sound like too many people. Yeah. But on some of my records, you can hear my influences. You can hear basically who, you know, uh, taught me without teaching me. You know what I mean? Who, who, who I really who I really admired and looked up to as a vocalist when I was a kid coming up. Yeah, definitely. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it's like, because to me, right, you know, like, I'll try to do my little singing one-two thing just to harmonize a hook or something, but nothing crazy, right? I have a very small range. I'm not, I'm not that, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm a rapper when it comes to anything else, but like the, all the, the little nuances and things you have to learn in singing and just like, you know, how to project, you know, and just there's so many levels to it that, um, you know, it's just incredible that, you know, to be able to teach yourself, like how long, how long would you say that it took you to get from, you know, when you really first started mimicking your favorites and stuff to get to a point where you were happy enough with your skill set to go out and show people and do it publicly like how long of a period between that well here's well, well, well here's the thing here's the thing you know um from the moment i opened up my mouth to sing and this is coming from professionals this is coming from from because you know my mom and my grandmother were really, really cool and really in, in, in looped up with, you know, uh, salsa singers and, 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 and a lot of different, um, instrument players and things like that. Rafi Sabatel and Johnny Sabatel and Ismael Miranda was my grandmother's cousin. And there's just so much history with, <clears throat> with my background that, you know, a lot of people don't know that is 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 amazing, but I had a God given gift and from what I told from what I'm told and from what I remember, from the minute I opened up my mouth to sing it was on a professional level. Wow. Like I hit octaves and ranges and notes that average kids weren't singing you we pretty much have them we've seen them on television throughout the years we get wild with a bunch of children a bunch of kids that come on stage and sing you know we get wild and some of them sing to to, to perfection and some of them need help well i'm told that as a child and as far as i can remember myself from the minute i opened up my mouth to sing and every show i did it was almost near perfection but you know yeah that's so crazy. I got a naturally God-given gift, and a lot of people don't even know my full potential because they've only heard me on hooks, and they've heard, you know, bits and pieces of what I can do. A lot of people have not heard my full potential, which is what we're working on. We have so much music to give the world, you know, that's going to show the world. Unless you come to a live Tony Sunshine show, and you hear me sing a cappella, or you go on YouTube and you watch me perform at, 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 at Radio City Music Hall, or, you know, 
uh, at a concert event, you won't know that I really sing the way I sing due to the features that I have done. Yeah. You know what I mean? I think the first glimpse we gave the world that Tony Sunshine was actually a real talented singer was with She's Like the Wind. And although She's Like the Wind was an amazing record, and I enjoyed recording that record, still in all with that record there, I didn't show my full vocal ability. Yeah. You know, that wasn't my full potential. Yeah, man, like, you know, um, well, you know, just even speaking about, like, the hooks and stuff, um, one thing I wanted to say, you know, the joint you guys did, uh, You Fat Joe, Armageddon, All I Need, I love that song, man, you know, ever since the first time seeing it on BT, uh, whatever it was, 106 back in the day, wherever, where, whatever program I seen it on originally, but to this day, man, you know, um, just absolutely love that song, man, um, you know, you, you, you absolutely killed it, you know, the production on it, the verses, you know, just anybody, you know. Thank you. It, it just, it's one of those songs and it just resonates really real, you know, just like, you know, those love songs. It's just, it's, it, it's, it, I think it's one of the best hip hop, um, you know, girl tracks done. Like, you know, I, I put it in top 20 probably, you know, of all time, in my opinion. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Yeah, man. Appreciate that. Yeah, I think, I think sometimes I want to say it to Joe, but it's not, it's not my uh, show and it's his and. He's a professional, and I know that he definitely knows what he's doing, and he definitely knows what he wants. So, but sometimes I want to tell him, like, bro, let's perform all I need. Yeah. Because I know the females are going to react to it, you know. But it's a, it's, it's a record that was really dope, and it served its purpose, and it has its moment in time, but I really feel like they overlooked that record. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, Just man. Just tap it. Cause that's one of those ones, you know? you know, yeah, if you do that at the show, that's going to go up with the girls in the audience. Like, Joe's got yeah. tons of street yeah. classics, I you do know. It, I, I do it at my shows, yeah. and I get the girls to sing some of the, the, the lyrics, and it's really dope. Yeah. Imagine if Joe and I did it together on stage. That'd be wild, man. That'd be wild. Yeah, it'd be dope. What was the, really like, dope. what was the recording process of doing that track like? Like, was that one, like, because you mentioned earlier that a lot of times you don't write, you just kind of go in off the vibe. Was that your approach to handling that chorus when you guys recorded it as well? Well, the all I, all I, all I need, uh, that hook, that particular hook right there was actually written by Dre from Cool and Dre. Oh, really? You know, yeah, that, that, that whole entire, uh, vibe was his idea. Okay. The hook was written by him, and then you know I went in and 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 I went in and did the hook, and then the ad libs and the backgrounds and all that were my idea. You know, one day he came in almost when the song was almost done, and he was like, "Yeah, you remember the new edition? Uh, this new edition record?" And he was like, "I got an idea. Maybe you should go in there and sing this part." And I went in there and we knocked it out. Mm. And the rest is history. But yeah. it was a team effort. You know, that song right there was just a whole complete team effort from Joe to me to Dre to Armageddon. It was a whole full terror squad collaboration. And, you know, that's how that record came about. I love that record, man. And that, that's cool that you mentioned that part, too, with the new edition, because um, I'm a little younger, right? So I didn't know the new edition record like that. And um, I actually just heard that new edition f record for my first time probably about three years ago. And when that, the, that part of the song <laughs> comes on, I'm like, yo, uh, I'm like, I remember like, oh, that. I'm like, what the hell did I hear that in? And then it, it took me a minute. I'm like, yeah, that's uh, Tony Sunshine on the All I Need joint. <laughs> I can't wait to come out to Canada, man. I got yeah. a few things to take care of, but we'll be out there soon. I promise we'll be out there soon. Oh, that'd be great, man. You know, I'll definitely, if you if you guys stop yeah. in Toronto, I'll, I'll definitely be there, man, 100%. Yes, sir. Um, yep. So another thing I want to ask about, too, you know, before we kind of move forward in the history, but, you know, just talking about mimicking, uh, you know, your favorites and learning how to sing in that way. Um, you mentioned Stevie Wonder, and I seen in an interview before that you... Uh, talked about when you met Stevie Wonder and you were, you were just speechless, you couldn't say anything and he's like, you gonna say anything? And, uh, yeah, I've seen him in the I've seen him in the uh, elevator in the Sony building <laughs> and uh, I really couldn't I really couldn't get it out, man and he was like, yo, but you're not 
you ain't gonna say nothing. <laughs> it's amazing. You know what I mean? Like I guess he's just such an amazing being. Like he's just a God given uh entity. Like his music, his his personality and just, you know, uh mastering the world while not being able to see it is amazing. You know, and it's like I don't know if the person he was with uh, made him aware and with a special kind of way or something, but yeah, he was aware that there were people in the elevator and he was funny about it. He was really, <laughs> really genuinely uh, comedic about it and it was dope. And still, no, I still couldn't say anything. <laughs> you know, it's just respect. Like, yeah. what can I say to, what can I say to such a giant? Like, what will my conversation be? Well, how can I, how, how can I make it how can I make a difference from what anybody else says to him? Yeah. You know, so I, I, I kind of felt like, you know what, I'm going to just sit here and be quiet as a sign of respect and admire. Yeah. And, and, and cherish this moment forever. That's so cool, man. You know, like, to, be, to you know, just meeting your heroes is a cool thing, you know. Through doing interviews like this, you know, um, it becomes kind of normal after a little bit, I guess. But just, you know, it's just the coolest thing in the world, like, being able to you know, subjectively look at it and be like, yo, man, like, 16-year-old right. me would be just right. bugging right now. Like, it's like, um, <laughs> but I was curious as well, too, because, um, you know, I, with that, like, that in itself is just, uh, you know, such a cool story, but, like, is there any other times, you know, since you've been doing this music thing, you've met any of your other heroes like that and, like, um, like, just had those moments where you've been like, I don't even know what to say right now, like... I believe so. You know, I've, I've ran into. I, I can tell you that. You know, again, like, like, I love music to the point that I try to separate the person from the music when they have, when they have let the world down and they've done some things that is just like, damn, for real. Like, how are we gonna do this here? Yeah. You know what I mean? How are we going to separate the music from the individual? So as far as R. Kelly goes, you know, before understanding that he was a troubled individual and before learning that there were some things about him that the world wasn't going to like, yeah. you know, uh, and, and now having five daughters and now understanding, you know, how wrong it is and, 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 and the trauma that, you know, was caused and things of that nature, not to go on. But I say that to say that, you know, when I when 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 I first got to see him face to face in person, it was just a whole nother thing. Like it was it was like seeing the alien from outer space, you know, for me. Yeah. As a kid coming up, looking at his idol, looking at, you know, one of my, 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 my inspirations, it was crazy. You know what I mean? I, I, it was like a whole, I can't explain the feeling. I can't explain, you know, what what I was thinking at the moment. But that was a crazy, that was a crazy time. You know what I mean? Been going on to work with them and being able to, 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 to experience, you know, studio sessions and things of that nature to where I've never seen no fuck shit happen, by the way. So yeah. don't ask. Yeah. <laughs> I really never did though, but you know, I, 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 uh, yeah, it was crazy, man. Meeting him was crazy. Seeing Casey and JoJo from Joe to see face to face, you know, and just listening to them talk, that was a super fucking amazing moment. Like, holy shit, it's Casey and JoJo. Not to say that the rest of Joe to see wasn't significant and Devontae and you know, they're amazing. Yeah. But Casey and JoJo are just a whole totally different uh, ball game. You know what I mean? They just like gods and this shit. So meeting them and seeing them face to face was also a life changing experience. And just curious too, like, uh, you know, when you've had the chance to work with like, you know, some people that, you know, have influenced you so heavily, like R. Kelly and stuff like that. Like after those studio sessions, is there anything you've taken home from after those studio sessions to incorporate, 
you know, in to into the way that you work in the studio Definitely. moving forward? Definitely. Definitely. I'd be a whole fool if I didn't. Yeah. When you you know, when you when you when you're sitting in the studio with a known genius or known geniuses, like let's just say let's just say, you know, you're sitting in the studio with Pharrell. You know, and you're not sitting there absorbing and and, 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 and being a sponge and you know, you're not sitting there taking bits and pieces and just putting them in your mental computer and taking them home so that you can better your skills and you can better your craft, then what are you doing this for? Yeah. If you're sitting in the studio with Timberland and you're watching him, you know, display his drum pattern and how he puts things together and he's allowing you to learn. You know, he's allowing you to sit there and, and, and watch him. And you don't take some of those skills home and incorporate them in your craft. And what are you doing it for? Yeah. No, that's you know, fact. so it's a given. It's a given. And anyone in this game and anyone in this industry that tells you that's not how they move, then they're lying to you. Because this game is about each one teach one and, 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 you know, learning your craft from someone else. Yeah. Everybody and anybody in this game took bits and pieces of everyone's skills and perfected it and made it their own. Even if they built their own lane, even if they built their own platform and incorporated their own sound into it, they took bits and pieces of somebody else's game and created their own situation out of it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely, man. Well, that's the thing. You know, no idea is original, really. You know, everything is... You know, everybody's in inspired and influenced by someone, and you know, the greatest artists right. I feel like, you know, come exactly from right. that. Like cats like Drake, they they take pieces, little bits and pieces of all the little things that influence them and create their own thing out yeah. of that. You know. Yeah. And um, yeah. shout out, Drake is really dope. I yeah. like Drake. Yeah, definitely, I think man. He's really know? amazing. Rep in Toronto, you Super know what I'm dope. saying? <laughs> yeah. Um, I fuck with Tory a little more than I fuck with Drake, though. Yeah, no, nah, Tory's the shit, man. I fuck with Tory hard, man. He was. Nah, the, I respect. I, I I I super I superly and greatly respect Drake for what he does. But as an artist, as an artist, as a as a as a lyricist and as a songwriter, you know, um, I I I can relate more and fuck more with Tory than with Drake. Yeah. I, I, I agree. I think Tory's kind of more like the, you know, Tory's kind of like the street Drake, but he's just like, he's he's so different, though, you know what I mean? And just the different ranges of things he's able to pull off. Well, that's why I can insane. fuck with him. Yeah. That's why, that's why I think I can relate to Tory, because he has a little bit of street edge with him. Yeah. He's not no sucker. From what I've seen, he ain't no sucker. You know what I mean? So he makes R&B music, and he makes hip-hop and R&B music, but he ain't no punk. Yeah. Don't get it confused. And I think that's where I can relate to him, you know, more so. And some of the things that he talks about in his music, I can relate more so to. You yeah. know? Yeah, definitely, man. Because I'm a knucklehead. <laughs> I don't know if you know this, I'm a super knucklehead. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, coming from Terry Squad. There's a, lot, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of growth in me, a lot of growth. You know, I'm, 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 I'm much older and wiser and I move differently and... You know, um, I eliminated a whole lot of fuck shit that was going on in my life, and I don't allow bozos to come in my circumference, and we stay out the way, man. If you don't see me with Lowe's, you don't see me maybe with my wife, or maybe a few, maybe one or two more people, you know, then I won't be outside. I don't hang out with too many folks. So yeah. I'm a whole totally different guy, but. I still got knucklehead in me. You know what I mean? <laughs> hey, definitely, man. You know what? This is the way I see it. Terror Squad, y'all were like... Yeah, there was a time you guys were the bullies in the industry. You know what I mean? And like... You, I don't. I'm not saying whoever it might have been, but whoever was the softest guy in Terror Squad would be someone that most people should not want to fuck with. You know what I mean? I, I just put it like that. <laughs> well, Joe likes to say that you know, like in the interviews. I was just talking to Pistol Pete the other day on his podcast. Yeah. And he confirmed and was like, "Yo, bro, like a lot of people don't know that." They would say, yo, Pistol P, Pistol P needs to be, be calmed down and, 
you know Joe needs to, but in all reality, it was you, bro. And I was like, come on, Pete. He's like my nigga. If anybody needed to be calmed down, and if anybody was the wildest, craziest dude in the, in, in the whole team, it was you. <laughs> you know, but in my defense, in my defense, I was the baby. You yeah. Know? You know the baby is always the, the trouble. Yeah, you you, you know what I mean. It's like you got chip and, on the and also I'm gotta... surrounded. I, I'm also I'm the baby. I'm the baby, and I'm also surrounded by all these older guys and sub guys and gangsters yeah. that are supposed to protect me and defend me, and I knew it. So you could imagine the type of shit I was on. So <laughs> don't play with me. <laughs> Well, it's like, you know, that that's kind of like it put you in that situation where, for one, it's like you kind of got to prove yourself to your older brothers, you know, prove you ain't a punk. But at the same time, it's like, well, I can kind of get away with shit because if anything does pop off, I know my boys got my back and they ain't nothing to fuck with. Back. Back. <laughs> Yeah, man. Um, you know, but speaking of which, you know, just Terror Squad and all that, um, you know, I do want to get into, you know, with you, kind of the lineage, what we were talking about, you know, some crazy moments and stuff, but I want to start it kind of from the jump. So, I know you introduced yourself to Fat Joe when you were 13. I was just kind of curious, like, how, how did you get the opportunity to even get in front of Joe to begin with? Well, we come from the same neighborhood. Okay. Like, we come from Forest Project. We come from Forest Projects. There's two parts of Forest Projects. There's the first part and the second part. Argumentally, argumentatively, you know, we always talk about who, <laughs> what's the first half and who's the, what, what's the second half. Like, we're the original first part. No, you know. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. That was the inside joke and yeah. shit we talk about. But Joe's from Forest Projects. Um, I moved to Forest Projects in 1990, uh, 1991, going on 1992, uh, I heard about, I heard about a group called Digging in the Crates, Diamond D, Showbiz, AG, OC, North Finesse, Big Al, you know, yep. and they had a Spanish dude that was down with them. That was intriguing as as a kid, you know. Uh, never mind that I was just learning about hip hop, you know, because I was into salsa music and R&B music, and then moving into Forest Projects, and it was just a whole different element, a whole different uh, scenery, you know. And um, through a mutual friend of ours that I started hanging out with as a kid and just being curious and running around and living in the neighborhood and things like that. You know, I kind of asked them how I would go about, you know, letting somebody hear my music or hear me sing anyway, because I didn't have an actual recorded professional record or had I ever been into an actual professional recording studio. Yeah. So I asked them how I could let someone hear me sing and stuff like that, and he was like, yo, Fat Joe. And I was like, holy shit, Fat Joe, uh, digging in the crease, this, that, blase, blase, and he was like, yeah, that guy. And Joe was working on his Represent album, you know, Flo Joe and, yep. and, and, and all of that. So um, one day he came to the neighborhood, one day he came to the neighborhood and he stopped at he stopped at the store on 166 and Trenton Avenue across the street from 23 Park. And I gained the courage to walk up on him and I told him I sang. And he was like, well, sing something for me, shorty. Do you know what I mean? This is young Fat Joe and young Tony Sunshine. Yeah. 13-year-old Tony Sunshine, you know. So he said, sing something for me, shorty. And I sang Forever My Lady by Jodeci for him. And I blew him away. He was like, oh, oh, holy shit. Like, you, oh, you sing, sing. Like, you ain't, you're not playing. Like, you sing, sing. And I was like, yeah. He was like, that's dope, shorty. He conversated with me from the middle of the block all the way to the corner. Um, He jumped in his, in his MPV and he broke out. The, the very next day, he pulled up to the block with God bless it there, full flex, and full flex opened the door, jumped, he, he first he lowered the window and told me to jump in the car. 
And I was like, huh? And then he jumped out. He was like, come on, R&B, because they would call me R&B, <laughs> you know? And I jumped in the car with him, and the rest is history. You know, I remember going with him to Relativity Records, you know, before Steve Rifkin branched off and opened Loud Records. Yeah. Uh, I remember doing video music box with him. I remember going to go see High Five. And, you know, I believe that the whole reason for going to see High Five was for, so that I could sing for them and Joe can uh, secure a deal for me. But I was so young at the time and I needed guidance and things of that nature. And, 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 and they were moving and they were doing what they was doing. And I believe that they didn't have time to hold my hand. So, of course, I had to wait my turn until I was much older. Yeah. You know, during the process, during the process of waiting my turn and during the process of just waiting to get much older, you know, uh, a guy by the name of Moondog started coming to the neighborhood with some of the fellas that we would uh, create ciphers with and bang on the mailboxes and rhyme and shit like that. We started bringing a guy called Moondog from down the block, Davidson, you know, who would just play basketball and play handball and tell jokes and play cards and, you know, drink 40s and play fight. And this guy was just a goon. And everybody used to spit in the cypher and rhyme, and, you know, he was just a spectator, and he would just listen. You know what I mean? And one day, he just started talking, like, just telling people that they were whack. Like, yo, bro, you whack. Like, your niggas just spit the same shit over and over again all the time. <laughs> you know, in fact, I'm going to go home. In fact, I'm going to go home, and I'm going to write some shit, and I'm going to come back, and I'm going to flame everybody. You know, and that's exactly what he did. You know, I don't need to tell you, you should already know that later on in life, Moondog pun? goes on to become Big Pun. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, and yeah. Yep. That's crazy. You know, Pun was just a comedian on the block. Pun was just a big, strong guy. Like, Pun would actually sit there and pull his tank top up and you know, grab a bat and give you the bat and tell you to smack him in the stomach full speed ahead. I'm talking about, like, way right before he, you know, became a, 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 a superstar rapper. Yeah. These are the type of things that he would love to do, and, and these are the type of games he would play. Like, this is how strong he really was and how militant, you know, he was and, and, and how disciplined he was with his mind and his shit. Like, you know, he was just a strong person. You would smack him full speed ahead with the bat, or if not, he was going to fuck you up. <laughs> hit me with the bat. Hit me with the bat. And if you don't hit me with the bat, when I catch you off guard, I'm going to tear you up. <laughs> Nobody wanted to get caught off guard and get beat up, so you would smack him with the bat full speed ahead. You know, another thing he would do is he would grip the bricks on the building. Let's just say, you know, he would bend his knees a little bit and squat and tell you to jump on his back. And then the next person would jump on their back. And the next person and the next person and the next person. And by the time you realize, Pun got about 10 to 12 people on his back and he's doing squats with them. And everybody's holding on to the bricks of the building, almost reaching the second floor. Holy fuck. And Pun is doing squats with those 12 people on his back. If I'm lying, I'm flying. I got arch wings on my back. You can ask anybody that knows will tell you that this is the truth. From the bat story to doing squats with 12 people on his back to he was just in the, he was just a different breed, this guy. Wow. Like, for real. Oh, it's crazy, man. For real, for real. That's actually, you know, you know, when you hear, when you hear, when you hear that he used to read encyclopedias and dictionaries and chew rocks, that is not a myth. Like, I've never seen nobody chew a rock, a real rock, but not like a real, a real, you know, rock that's as solid as metal type shit. And Poe would sit there and master and read encyclopedias and dictionaries and actually chew rocks, but for real. I've never seen nobody destroy a rock with their, with their teeth, ever. That's fucking wild, man. That's wild, man. And actually, you know, yeah, 
always different. Just talking about Pun, you know, because uh, when we first brought him up, you talked about how he's just a funny dude on the block and stuff, and you know, I know that I, I know um, Pun was one of those dudes. He was uh, very serious, could be very scary. He's not the type of person you want to piss off, but I also know Pun was just uh, hilarious. He wasn't the guy you wanted to piss off. Yeah. He wasn't the guy you wanted to piss off, you know. But at the same time, if you did piss him off, then you must have really played yourself because Pun was just a happy go lucky wear your heart on your sleeve. Yeah. You know, make you smile. What is it I could do for you? You know, what do I have to do to make you smile? What's going to cause, what, what can I do to keep a permanent smile on your face? Yeah. You just don't hurt my feelings. Just don't hurt my feelings. You know what I mean? You got a problem, come talk to me about it. Don't hurt my feelings. Don't violate me in any way. And it's bulletproof love. I got you forever and ever. Endeavor and ever. I'll take the shirt off my back. I'll give you my last $5. I'll drive 10 hours from my house to go get you if you're in trouble. Just don't ever violate me. Yeah. You know what I mean? So if you got pun angry and you was on his bad side, woo. <laughs> he was definitely on his bad side. Yeah. But if he loved you and he fucked with you and it was genuine, forget about it. You know, Pun was the type of individual that'll buy you a car, a chain, and give you keys to the apartment at the same time as he loved you. What's up? You, you good? You all right? Oh, hold on for a minute. Come here. What's this? I bought you a chain. What's this? The keys to your car. What do you mean? Just drive it to the front of your house and park it. Wow, here's the keys. <laughs> Pone was just bugged out, man. Oh, man. Pone was bugged out. And, you know, like, um, the, one, the one thing I did want to ask, but I mean, actually now, like, uh, you know, just talking about the two sides, it kind of prompts me to want to ask about both. But the first thing I was going to ask, like, um, you know, because I know you spent a lot of time around Pone. It's probably hard to even just put your finger on it. But if you, like... What was, like, what's your funniest memory of, like, you know, something pun did or just being around pun? If you can, if, if like, you know, if you can even think of one. I'm sure there's so many, but. Nah, it was too many. It yeah. was just too many. But pun was just a prankster, you know. Water fights, from water fights to, to food pranks to, you know, one time we drove into Mexico. We went into Mexico. And uh, we went into an Army and Navy store, and in this Army and Navy store, for some reason, they had blank guns, but real blank guns. Yeah. Like, not cap guns, blank guns, like movie prop guns. Yeah. Like, they look super official. Uh, you know, you can you can load up the clip with blank bullets. Uh, the shells actually fly out the nose. Sparks actually come out. It's just, it was just too much. So what happens is Pun decides to buy a bag of guns, you know. And uh, we used to have shootouts and things like that in the middle of the street, in the recording studios, in front of the bodega. And the average person doesn't know what the fuck is going on. So, you know, the whole neighborhood is running and the cops are being called and people are screaming and crying and, <laughs> you know, it wouldn't be funny. It wouldn't be funny to everybody, but those who know and those that are watching are like, "Look at this wild shit! Is crazy." <laughs> and we used to go in front of a, a club. There's this club, very famous, very legendary club in New York City called the Tunnel. Oh yeah, yeah. And once or twice we went to the front of the tunnel, and Pun would tell me, "Yo, we gonna wait." For this shit to get fully loaded, the line to be down the block, and then we gonna have a shootout. <laughs> <laughs> so we did it the first time, and uh, the head of security, I forget his name, pretty good guy. Like he caught a glimpse of what was going on, and he thought it was funny the very first time. And the second time, he looked at us like, "Yo." You guys are about to fuck up all the money right now because the lines is crazy down the block. Yeah. You guys are about to fuck up all the money right now. And, you know, Pun didn't even 
look like he, you better, you better let you better let off five or six shots or I'm gonna fuck you up when I catch you. <laughs> 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 so of course you know I let off a few shots. <laughs> <laughs> but we did it about twice and that was it. And, you know, the water guns and riding through forty second street and asking people for addresses with a blank piece of paper. And when they look down, pun is in the back, looking through the back window and just hits them with the super soaker. Like, it was just too much pranks. Too many pranks. Oh, man. Yeah, you know, like, um, I know, you know, there's so many uh, memories of Pud, you know, crazy stories and stuff, which I did want to, see, you know, maybe ask a little bit on that side, too. But one thing I always like to ask about, you know, people like Pun or Price, with people who spent time with them, is what their funniest memories are. Just because I know, you know, both those dudes were just fucking, just hilarious people, man, you know. And... Nah, hilarious. They were hilarious. Yeah, man, but you know, on the, on the other side of that spectrum, too, you know, with Pun being so wild and stuff, I was curious, like, you know, well, and even, you know, you saying that you were you were wild, too, you know, but, like, what what was, like, uh, maybe, like, I don't know if it's even something you could talk about either, either way, but, like, what would be, like, your, your, just your wildest memory or, like, maybe even scariest memory, you know, around the times rolling with Pun and stuff? Hello?